Okay, so the broadcast has, um, has started. Everyone, welcome to the, the webinar. We will get going in a few moments time, um, but I'm just gonna leave it a few moments until, um, until um, all of the participants have time to join um, and just have a chance to, to get logged in and, and make sure everything's working okay. Okay, I think we're probably good to, um, I think we're, we're good to get started. Um, what I would say to those who are joining the call is that we will make a recording of it. So if you miss pits or if you have to jump out early, then, um, then please do so. Um, Josh, Ginny, do you, can I hand over to you? Yes, that sounds good. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, we've got uh, quite a few names of uh, on the call, about 30 people, lots of names I recognize from our Thunder Advisory Group, but also lots of new names. So um, I think we'll, um, we'll, we'll do a little bit of an introduction to um, what Crossref is and what we've been working on for the grant infrastructure. And um, mainly we'll hear from three different funding organizations who'll give their perspectives on this work. Um, and I also want to make sure that we have time for questions at the end. So I'd encourage everybody, please, you should see a Q&A button at the, at the, the bottom of your window. Um, so please pose questions for any speaker at any stage, um, and then we'll facilitate those at the end. Um, everybody is muted because it's quite a large group, and I think people are still joining now. So... Um, We'll, we'll do it that way rather than uh, uh, unmute everybody um, and risk the background noise. Um, so there's a few, a few crossroad people on the call. I'll just briefly introduce um, who we are. Um, you'll hear them at various points. Rachel has been um, helping uh, sort of get this webinar set up and you had your invitation from her. She's responsible for the community outreach at Crossref. Um, my name is Ginny Hendricks. Um, I'm the director of community at, at Crossref and um, that includes the, uh, this sort of activity um, and our whole sort of proposition really to various, um, various communities and things like technical support and stuff. And we also have um, Kirsty Meddings, who's the product manager for the funder registry and also for this grant ideas project, which is the focus of this webinar. Um, so sort of te technical questions, and things like that. I'm hoping we can um, bring Kirsty in to help answer those. Um, and then Josh Brown is our funder engagement consultant and he's with us. You may know him, some of you from ORCID, who um, we work with pretty closely, of course. And now he's uh, specifically focused on introducing Crossref to funders and rolling out this Grant IDs initiative. Um, so I'll hand over to Josh, who will go through a little bit about what Crossref is, um, talk about the Funder Advisory Group, what we've been doing the last couple of years, um, essentially in order to help everyone in the community link funding um, to research outputs. Um, and I will jump in again to introduce further speakers and then facilitate questions at the end. So um, over to you, Josh. Thanks, Ginny. And, and thanks everyone for joining us today. 
Um, the, the title of this presentation is Connecting Funding, uh, not just funders. And I think that will, what that means will become clear as we go through. Um, but I think it's really important um, just to introduce this to so the idea is that connecting funding, it's not just about identifying a grant or a particular intervention, it's about making connections between that and the wider world of consequences that it cre creates, whether that's project activities, research outputs and publications, data sets, um, career impacts, there's a whole range of different topics that are covered here. So, um, as Ginny said, my name, I'm Josh Brown and I'm Funder Engagement Consultant at Crossref. Um, and Crossref, um, the Crossref mission is to make research outputs easy to find, cite, link, assess and reuse. And I think that, re that that's really important in the context of connecting funding to these because all of this activity is made possible by the actions of funders, by research supporting organisations who actually, you know, pr em employ people, provide equipment, provide facilities, provide the environment in which research takes place. And Crossref itself is a not-for-profit membership organization that exists to make scholarly communications better. And really we believe that linking funding, um, adding transparency, exposing more of the connections between all of the contributions to research that come out across the community is making scholarly communications better. So that's really where we're, where we're coming at. Um, a few years ago in our board conversations, um, there was a recognition that actually we needed to work more with funders. Now we have, uh, and I'll come on to this in just a moment, been working with the funding community for many years. Um, but the crucial thing here is funders are increasingly um, part of more of the scholarly communication dialogues. And actually, you know, the, the, what Crossref need to do is adapt and enhance to actually meet the needs of those organisations and bring the benefits of that data to the wider research community. So our members, and I think this is really important to state again, is they're members of produce professional and scholarly materials and content. Now, anybody who produces any material in the scholarly space whether that's in a, a grant record information about a grant or a, a journal article or a book chapter, it all counts. Um, so just, just, just to give you that context there. Now, it, our history of working with funders goes back a long way. Um, the product many of you will have heard of is the Open Funder Registry, which launched in 2012. And it's a taxonomy of funding bodies, each identified. Um, and that, that, that registry has grown from 4,000 to more than 20,000 funders now. Um, the data it was originally donated and it's updated by Elsevier under a CC0 license, so it's completely open. Um, and we work together to update and enhance and extend that data and make sure that it's up to date. And you can search for that now. Um, so this is just a screenshot of, you know, searching just before we hit 20,000 funders, um, connect, showing that the funders and all the connections to the work. And the search results here you can see um, this is an example of, of, of the SNF, the Swiss National Science Foundation, who are actually members of our funder advisory group. Now, what, this, what, we, what we find though is that we've identified funders, and as you know, we identify a lot of scholarly content. We've identified well, more than 100 million. This is actually the, the logo for when we passed 100 million items registered, but we're now, now more like 110 million. Um, but there's a challenge there because that's a huge number. It's a very impressive number of content records, but actually only three and a half percent of those, roughly, have funding information attached. And of that number, an even smaller portion have funded DOI or specific information about the funding organization. So we have got low take up and we do have, but we do have some connections between the funding agency, the organization that provided that funding and and, organ and, and, and the outputs. So in order to explore the ways that we could address some of this, in 2017 through 2018 and to up to the present time, we've been working with our funder advisory group. And we've been looking at the infrastructure needs, the challenges that we face, how we could be working to better connect grants and outputs and activities, uh, and how that could be used to streamline reporting and analysis and all the other benefits that could flow from that. Now that working group set up two additional subgroups. One was a technical group 
um, which gathered, uh, you know, gathered grant metadata schema elements, looked at the, the information that funders publish about grants, and the other was to look at membership and understanding how this activity, a service that provides identifiers for grants and an open API, an open database of grant information, how that could be sustained uh, within Crossref as a, as a, as a host organization. So we've had a lot of, in, alongside that group, had a lot of individual discussions with funders and sponsor organizations, as, as, as we said here, in, like Europe PMC. And here are just some of the slots, some of the people we've been working with, but you can see this is a truly global, multidisciplinary, multi-focus group. Um, and um, I'm really pleased that uh, we've got three, three of the organizations represented on this slide are with us today. Uh, to speak about the work they have been doing um, with Crossref, with grant IDs and their plans for the future. So I think this will, you'll get much more of a sense of how funders are actually engaging with this um, later on. But I'd like to generally explain that what we're, what, we, what we're doing is we are enabling funders to register metadata about grants at the point of award, to update it in the future. Um, if they want to upload information about previous grants, they can and they can attach a DOI to that record. Um, Crossref will provide search and lookup tools to make it easy to link that to outputs, activities, and other things. Now, the reason that we are doing this and the reason we have chosen this approach is that there are significant benefits for a global grant identifier. Um, now, one thing I'll say is that it's, it's really, and this is, I can't overstate this, Grant IDs paint a rich picture of research support. They can illustrate connections between projects and collaborators, linking people and organizations to outputs and activities. They, are, they can help you identify pockets of expertise and emerging areas of activity as you can start to see what's being funded, new disciplinary areas, new techniques, new practices that are starting to become a focus of, uh, of funding support. And they also fill in it's quite significant gaps in the map of the research landscape. And here I'll refer back to the, those numbers earlier of 110 million uh, plus content records with only 2.6 million linked to funder organizations. Well, imagine if we could link more of that 110 million to specific grants and specific programs of activity. That's a lot of new data and much better quality information. What that all of those, all of this richer picture and all this additional quality information helps us to maintain a healthier research environment. One, it means that there's with more transparency, more open information. It's easy to see if there is overlapping uh, grants, re repeat applications, no, reduce that duplication of efforts and make it more efficient. Um, it's possible to look for conflicts of interest. Um, when reading um, articles, you can see who paid and use that in your terms of you making your assessment on the integrity and the, and, the, and, the, and the reliability of those results. And also in terms of a healthy research environment, it, that is made by researchers, long, active, productive research careers. So understanding the impact of funding on those career development, career development activities, whether that's studentships or fellowships or anything else, is really important. Understanding where those, if those PhD students that you funded stay in, um, stay in academia or move to industry is vital for funders. And finally, I think, you know, in understanding that, those longitudinal analyses, you need accurate data. So the idea here is by exposing this information consistently, reliably and openly, we enable people to search for grants, investigators, projects, organizations, information, infrastructures, equipment, all of these things that are supported by and associated with grants. You can track the impact of funding shared systems much more accurately, whether that's, uh, whether that's funding, fund, funding work that takes place in hospitals or takes place in archives or, um, you know, giant research infrastructures like the particle accelerators at CERN. But it also means that you save researchers time and you save administrators time because you can actually simplify the process of research reporting and automate a lot of that process, which means you'll get faster, more accurate, cleaner data to support your analytics, but it also frees up some of that expertise and some of that energy to actually dive into difficult, difficult problems that aren't fixed by this, emerging outputs, new systems, new kinds of impact or analysis. Um, now, I, 
I'd just like to kind of finish on a quote from our, our friends at the Wellcome Trust, Robert Kylie and Nina Frentrup, um, who wrote a blog post about why Wellcome supported um, our work on grant IDs and what they wanted to see from it. And here they see this researchers manually disclosing what outputs have arisen from funding and the idea that this could be fully automated in the future. And publishers' repositories could require the grants to be disclosed using a simple search or lookup or uh, you know import tool, um, pulling it from the cross from our Crossref API, and that data could then be accessed. It can be attached. It can be embedded in articles. It can be attached to the metadata. It can be machine harvested, um, and all these analytics platforms, reporting platforms, can harvest that. And then the job is not for researchers to come and tell funders what they've done. It's to check that funders have everything. That's a much shorter, much simpler job. And ultimately, it makes, it, it's, it's a visible benefit to researcher, but it makes funders' lives much easier. It means funding is, um, fund, funding is more transparent, it's more uh, accountable, and it brings benefits across the community. So thank you for your attention. Um, I'll pass back to Ginny, who will introduce the next two speakers. Thank you, Josh. Yes, um, so that was a fairly whirlwind uh, rundown of what the Crossref proposition is. Um, and uh, as I said at the beginning, I think what we'd like to do is hear from the research funders who are, who've helped uh, get, get us to this point and who are planning to implement it and, and how. Um, so I think I'll, I'll introduce people one by one. First, we'll, we'll hear from... Um, Carly Robinson, who's uh, Assistant Director for Information Products and Services at the um, US Department of Energy Office of Scientific and Technical Information, so OSTI or OSTI. And um, she's been very involved uh, from the beginning, I think. Um, she focuses on the dissemination of DOE funded research and development results through OSTI's suites of tools and services and I think the perspective from a it's quite a complex US federal funding landscape will be uh, really interesting so I'll hand over to you and, and I see you've already shared your screen thank you Carly so I will shut up and let you get on with it thank you thank you um, so as was mentioned I'm from the US Department of Energy Office of Scientific and Technical Information or OSTI um, and I'm gonna briefly talk about my involvement with the Crossref funder advisory group and some of the activities that the group work on worked on that Josh also hit on so um, my involvement with the group started kind of right at the beginning of when we were talking about identifiers for grants or awards and that that was in September of 2017. Um, and when Crossref convened some of the first meetings, um, we were really discussing this idea more generally. There was a discussion paper um, for us to consider and to walk through. Um, we talked a lot about um, the type of persistent identifier that would make sense for this. So whether that was a DOI or, you know, some different type of persistent identifier. And of course, there was a lot of discussion about the terminology, um, what this should be called, um, if it should be grant, funding, award, um, you know, there's, there's no perfect terminology. So we had a lot of conversations about, you know, what it should be called. Um, and as Josh mentioned very quickly, we split up into two working groups that um, had some slightly different membership, although I think there was some overlap. I happened to sit on both. Um, but, you know, there was so much to discuss and so much um, work to do that we split into the governance and membership and technical and metadata working groups. And um, on the governance and membership, we really talked a lot about um, fee structure options for assigning DOIs to grants and awards. And at that point, um, you know, I think it was decided that it made sense to go with DOIs. Um, there was also a lot of discussion about um, what steps need to be taken to allow um, funders to be Crossref cross members and how all of that would work. Um, and then, as Josh mentioned, on the technical and metadata um, group, we really focused on the metadata schema. Um, you know, what fields should be required, um, what should be optional, various use cases that we wanted this um, um, service and schema to um, 
be able to help with. So, you know, we talked about projects versus awards, um, different types of awards, um, how uh, the schema could account for what's going on at user facilities, um, what happens when there's joint funding. So, and many, many more. So we were really kind of walking through um, various use cases that, that would be expected. And then also one of the um, working group members um, did a comparison to Dingo, which I was not familiar with at the time, but um, my understanding is that it's a, a knowledge graph ontology for projects and grants. And, you know, I don't think it, it can be a one-to-one -one comparison, um, but it, it, they had already done so much work in this space thinking about this. So we wanted to see, um, you know, if there was anything that we might be missing in the metadata schema um, and make sure that everything was accounted for. And so um, my involvement, um, like I mentioned, uh, started in September of 2017. And though uh, my office is not actually a funding office within the Department of Energy, um, as was mentioned, we collect, disseminate, and preserve all of the Department of Energy funded research outputs. Um, but we are heavily um, involved with and strongly support the use of persistent identifiers. And um, our history with that goes all the way back to 2004 when we became Crossref members so that we could assign DOIs to the technical reports um, that come out of DOE funding. And then, you know, we just kept going from there. We became data site members so that we could issue DOIs to um, data sets and software, ORCID members so that, you know, we could fully um, integrate with all of the work that ORCID was doing. And so, um, you know, we were heavily interested in what was going on um, with this group uh, because we were, you know, very interested in the grant DOI service, um, the schema, and how we could potentially offer a service around this at Department of Energy. And so throughout the process, you know, we were working to, well, in, in kind of um, towards the end of the process, working to share this information with the DOE funding offices to um, talk about how this could be applicable to them, to gauge their interest, but also talking more broadly across the U.S. government um, as, you know, we're very involved with um, interagency working groups. And so making sure that they, they knew about the work that was going on at Crossref. And I just wanted to hit on a specific use case that is something that we're thinking about um, within the Department of Energy at our user facilities. Um, for those who might not be familiar, the DOE user facilities are often located at the DOE National Labs. Um, and they can be anything from um, supercomputers to light sources to accelerators to um, atmospheric measurements, um, things like that. And, my office already works very closely with the user facilities um, to provide uh, DOIs to the outputs that are coming from the facilities. Um, and just like, you know, everyone else who's working in this space, they're very interested in kind of tracking the research life cycle um, and understanding their impacts. And, you know, they're, they're doing a lot of this tracking in their management systems, going from the proposal to the time awarded how the facility is used and what those outputs are. And they've done a lot of work um, to try to identify those research outputs and um, for the data and software assigned DOIs. Um, obviously, the publications will get DOIs from the publishers. But, um, you know, it can be difficult to, to track um, what is coming out of the facility. And that information can be in various places, um, in a publication, for example, um, whether it's the acknowledgement section or somewhere within the text. Um, and then it can be difficult sometimes also to identify, you know, the data or software coming out of that facility. So in the conversations that we have been having with the user facilities about assigning DOIs to the outputs, there's also been a lot of interest in assigning DOIs to the awarded time at the facilities. And the idea is, um, you know, to be able to link that awarded time to the outputs. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of interest and potential for um, offering, a, a, you know, this service to the DOE user facilities, assigning DOIs to the time that's awarded. And then they can create linkages, um, whether it's in, you know, the acknowledgement sections of a publication or hopefully using, um, you know, related identifier metadata fields um, for kind of data or software outputs to create persistent links between, between the time awarded at the facility and the research output. And with that, I will hand it back over.
Thank you very much, Carly. That was great. And thank, thanks for mentioning the, you know, your role on the advisory board and the, the different, uh, the technical group and the schema development. And we do actually have Diego Chalva on the, the call as well, in case people have uh, questions about how the schema was developed. But um, I see a few questions, but we will save them uh, for, for the end and, and go through them all together. Because uh, right now we're going to hear from Dan Smith at The Welcome. Uh, Welcome is one of the largest uh, charitable funders in the UK. So a very different perspective, mainly um, supporting research in the life sciences. And uh, they're very uh, uh, active in the drive towards open science, a supporter of many, many global initiatives in Europe, PubMed Central. And, and uh, they also happen to be the first... Um, research funder who is testing the registration of DOIs for grant Crossref. So um, I'll hand over to Dan and if you could introduce yourself and uh, let us know how that's going. Yeah, hi there. Um, hello. So yeah, this is London Calling um, here at Welcome. Um, so yeah, my name's Dan. I'm one of the analysts um, actually embedded within our grants department um, itself. So the department is actually responsible for managing awards from application to the actual funding. Um, so that's a bit about my background and how I got involved in this. So I'm basically responsible for all the data uh, that comes out of grants from award, uh, sorry, from application um, to part of the award. Um, so if I go through a um, bit about welcome. Um, so um, basically our mission is to support researchers taking on big health challenges, campaigning for best science um, and having everyone get involved with science and health research. Um, and that's the official strap line on our website. Um, so come to kill me if I didn't mention that. Um, but basically what that means is we, we fund a diverse range of activities all the way from basic science, policy work to translation activities in terms of like vaccines. Um, but we also cover things like cultural events and activities. So that could be like plays or um, sending um, academics into or scientists into schools um, to talk about their work. Um, so we're quite diverse in what we actually fund. Um, and this is stats for you um, for our last financial year. So um, for example, our portfolio um, as of last year was around three and a half thousand grants worth a total of 4.3 billion pounds um, over the life cycle um, of those awards. We funded 474 organisations in 97 countries. Um, you'll see the majority of funding is in the UK, but outside of the UK is becoming an increasing proportion of our um, portfolio. Um, and we do receive a lot of um, requests for funding every year. So last year we had um, 5,400 um, requesting nearly £3 billion pounds of funding, um, which translated to almost 950 awards um, with about £640 million. Pounds. Um, but if we're talking about 2016-17, we actually awarded um, and committed £1.1 billion pounds worth of funding. So we do spend a fair amount of money um, every year, um, but that's just a quick snapshot of what Welcome is and what Welcome does. Um, so idea wise, um, well, we want to get to a situation where every grant has a unique ID, which can be linked to the output. So whether that's articles, data, materials, patents, um, a conference, um, we want to be able to attribute everything we fund back to an award and what people actually do with the money. Um, so this will help us to measure the impact and success of our awards um, against welcome objectives. Um, we recently uh, launched internally a what we call the welcome success framework, um, which is a methodology around actually measuring that output and that impact of what we fund. Um, so this will go a long way to help identifying what we um, are funding and what the real world uh, implications of that are. Um, so as before, uh, as we said, uh, we'll make the identification of grants different research outputs more accurate um, while almost or simultaneously reducing the burden on researchers and awardees. Um, and as mentioned, yeah, currently researchers are to be asked to manually disclose this, um, but in future, the ideal scenario would be that these disclosures are fully automated. You drop in your uh, DOI, um, not just welcome, it could be other funders as well, because um, we do ask what other funding um, researchers have had. Um, so the application stage, for example, you could put in the DOI, it repopulates, it does a lookup um, and extracts all that information um, from Crossref and inputs that into our um, grants management system. So that's a kind of like ideal um, feature we're working towards. Um, but what also, one other good thing as well is that it provides a single source of truth. Um, it will allow welcome and others to verify that if someone has received our funding, what the value of that um, award is, how long it's running for, who's been involved, 
what organizations and countries are involved um, with that award. So it's a good way of um, kind of verifying um, that someone says they're funded by Wellcome, we can go, yep, uh, they definitely are, um, and allows other people to check as well um, on that. Um, as mentioned, we are one of the first uh, to be going live with this, so um, have some challenges, obviously, um, in attempting to um, produce these DOIs. Um, so Europe PMC, um, who are another partner, are going to be producing the XML markup and depositing the DOIs with Crossref on our behalf, um, because we already send our information over to Europe PMC, um, allowing researchers to deposit existing papers um, with them. Um, so we've been working with Europe PMC, and a big thank you to them, um, to ensure that uh, all the data has been updated, because historically, You've sent the information over, it's there as a container for researchers to deposit their information and then that's it, we've left it. Um, so obviously over the years that data has become out of date, um, there are grants that should have been included in the um, European submissions that haven't been um, for various reasons. Um, one big thing is any joint and co-applicant details have never been sent to European C. Um, only the lead applicant um, has been included. So that's something we've been working to um, correct and get in um, the EPMC database. Um, there's also been challenges around um, updating uh, the database itself to hold all parts of the metadata. So originally only certain fields um, that were able to be mapped directly um, to the uh, DOI schema. Um, so we've been working hard to get the metadata, um, the additional pieces of metadata um, over to European C. Um, on the weapon side, um, that has meant a new approach. Um, so what I've been working on um, is the data production side, the report side, um, to include the new metadata fields. Um, and something I'm not sure if it's unique to uh, welcome, but um, one um, one award uh, can be made of several grant records within the system. Um, and we have to effectively roll them up or aggregate them into one award, and therefore one DOI. Um, good examples of this um, could be where a grant has been transferred or um, it's been supplemented or perhaps put into a bit of a currency. Um, each of those changes um, is represented by a different record in our grant management system, which is Grant Tracker. And so that has presented some challenges on getting all the information and aggregating it into one record that can go, here we are, this is the truth, um, this is the single record um, for this particular award. Um, and of course, the classic issue of data cleansing. So things like people putting the salutations in their first name, so calling them doctor, doctor, um, in Grant Tracker, um, missing country information for organizations, um, and of course, aligning our grant types to the DOI classification system um, that's been put in place. Um, so data cleansing has obviously been a, a big issue. Um, that being said, um, it's going well. So what does the future look like for us? Um, so we'll hopefully, uh, by the end of the month, we'll have a uh, launch um, for all existing grants that we've sent over to European C. Um, so we're looking at around 10,000 or so um, grants stretching back to 2000. Um, as I said, uh, we'll be the first, hopefully the first uh, vendor to launch the DOIs. Um, so we're working to get the database changes in. Um, Testing of the manual depositing and generation of the DOIs has been a success. Um, so we're just working on the automatic depositing of the XML and the DOI generation. Um, now, historically, only grants with a what we say is a likely potential for generating uh, some kind of paper or output have historically been sent to European C. So initially, the DOIs we create will only be for a sample of the grant types we award. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do fund a diverse range of activities, um, not just limited to basic science. Um, so in the medium to longer term, we are looking to get all of our awards um, to have a DOI. Um, this would include things like grants for building and refurbishment, conferences, travel, um, equipment grants. Um, but this will also include our cultural science awards, which um, covers um, kind of outreach activities that we do around science or health. Um, but the, it could be things like plays, events, talks, and we've even funded video games. Um, so there's no reason why we don't shouldn't have a DOI for those. Um, and we're all very keen to have, basically have a DOI for everything we've ever funded. Um, so that's one of the things we'll be looking to do in the future. Um, and it's funny that the Culture Society Awards are actually the bulk of our awards we issue in terms of the number, um, but not necessarily the spend. Um, so the amount of DOIs that Welcome will generate will actually increase. Um, but as a proportion of actual 
um, amounts of money committed um, that do make up a, a smaller proportion. Um, but yeah, it's going well. Uh, and hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll have um, some live DOIs in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I think that's the end of my presentation, yes. So I'll hand back. Thank you, Dan. I think that's brilliant, especially um, I think the, the consideration about mapping your data internally, um, readying it for um, the grant schema here at Crossref is quite, quite an interesting point of consideration for others as well. So thanks for that. Um, again, uh, questions, please add them either into the chat or into the Q&A box and we'll, uh, we'll po post, pose them to our speakers at the end. Um, so now we're really lucky we've got um, actually a recording um, from the Japan Science and Technology Agency, but I noticed that um, Masashi Hara is also on the line, which is um, uh, very, <laughs> uh, very good because it's very late there in Japan, I think. Um, but I think we're going to play a recording and then... Um, uh, you can jump in if you like, um, Mazari. I'll just sort of give a little introduction. Um, JST actually has been a member of Crossref for many, many years, um, registering uh, publications with us. Um, and they're also a, a leading national funder in Japan. Um, and it's making sense for them to think about also registering the, um, the, the grants and awards that, that um, Japan as a country uh, invests in. Um, and uh, Mr. Hara himself is also in charge of open science and other global initiatives at JST that relate to research activities and information infrastructure. So I think we're going to hit play, Rachel, on the recording. Is that right? My name is Masashi Hara from JST, Japan Science and Technology Agency. I am working in the Department of Information Infrastructure where we deal with information services of scholarly papers, researchers' information, open science, and so on. JST is one of the biggest funding agencies in Japan, and it is under the Ministry of Science and Technology. JST funds mainly for the innovation-oriented research program. JST has also other businesses than funding, such as science museum, science communication, science education for high school, human resource development for innovation. This slide shows the workflow of research activities. Researchers described center get funding from upper side and do research activities. Also, Researchers submit their papers to publishers from center to right bottom. And their research data, research project information, are open to the public through certain platforms described in the left bottom. In the right side, such things are analyzed and it affects to national policies and the policy of funding bodies. JST has some roles in this workflow. As a funding agency, JST has several programs up to the top. JST is a member of DOI registration agency in Japan, Japan Link Center, or JALC, down the bottom right hand side. JST has a platform of domestic academic journals, JSTage, described in the same place. JST has some other platforms for research information, and JST Project Database and J Global, down the bottom left hand side. Our research database, a research map, helps application writing, up the top left hand side. This is the example page of JST Project Database, which brings almost all the projects. JST has funded, and now it has more than 20,000 projects. We are going to use this page as a landing page, and we will add the DOI name of grant ID down the bottom. Our web page is only Japanese text at this moment, so it is helpful to receive 
smart to language metadata, something to fund our discussion. We expect that through grant ID, it will be easier to know research output connected with funding information. And then we may be able to grasp the research output on time and more precisely, as well as to monitor if each paper is open access or not. These changes will fasten the decision making of the national policy and agency's policy. We hope we can make a decision with enough information and then our future would be better. Cool, thank you. That's great, thank you. I think making that point um, at, the, at the end there, reiterating that it's the point is to just know more about the outputs and outcomes of, uh, of, of research that's funded. Um, it's great, and thank you for being uh, on the line so late in Japan as well, really appreciate that. Um, okay, so now is the time um, for questions uh, from um, those of you who've been who've been listening, and also those of you who've been speaking. If you have questions for each other, that's fine too. Um, I am going to look. There's there was a couple in the chat window earlier. Um, so the first question is: um, this uh, global grant identifier will that be provided by Crossref? Uh, so the answer to that, I guess I can answer it, unless anyone else wants to jump in. <laughs> the answer to that is yes, <laughs> Crossref is, um, has developed the schema with this group um, uh, and uh, we are a DOI registration agency. So these DOIs for grants will be registered with us. So anyone wanting to do that will join Crossref as a member. Um, and that's, there's, you know, various sort of obligations attached to that about maintaining the metadata and all of that uh, data is made available openly through our search tool and APIs um, so that the whole community can use it. And the, um, the second question uh, that led on from that is how will this differ from, uh, how will this identifier differ from ORCID. So um, this is specifically an identifier to um, a, a grant record, so an awarded grant. Um, ORCID, um, most people will know, I'm sure, is an identifier for authors and contributors to that research. So clearly there's a huge link to be made between these and we work very closely with other persistent identifier um, registries so that we can make sure our schemas align and um, you know, lots of tools and services out there will pull data from both Crossref and ORCID, also putting metadata into both Crossref and ORCID, and of course, data site as well on the, on the data side, um, uh, to link all of these aspects together. Um, so it's sort of, it's, it's definitely not uh, a, an additional identifier for the same thing, but um, heavily will work with that. And I know Josh has been, um, you know, because of his work previously at ORCID um, with their funder working group, there's been quite quite a lot of um, synergies between between our work. And um, we, what we haven't done yet is, is come up with like the perfect diagram of a workflow that um, sort of shows how this fits in with this whole um, identifier map, really. But um, there are a lot a lot of identifiers that are um, open and persistent and global that. Um, Crossref and ORCID and, and DataSite are very, very uh, involved with and support um, and uh, will continue to do that. So I think there'll be a bit more information uh, in, you know, as things get implemented and we start to have lots of examples and we can start to actually really look at and use this data. Uh, yes, someone's saying so a workflow diagram would be helpful for discussing this idea with funder colleagues. Yeah, I think a, I think a visual is is in the works. Um, that's something we can follow up with um, in the coming weeks or month or so. Um, so Lakshmi, I hope that answered your questions about, um, you know, the Crossref's involvement and, and the relationship with with ORCID. Um, just ping if it didn't or if you have further ones. So um, 
going to the Q and A box. I think I'm going to hit this answer live, and I don't know if that means that everyone can see it, but there's a question from Nate Jacobs, who's a publisher, um, and is interested in how granular the DOI would be, organisational level um, or grant level. So it is, it is specifically for a grant, and there were a lot. Of, for an awarded grant. So there was a lot of discussion about what types of awards would be um, uh, suitable. And there's a, there's a taxonomy actually of um, funding types uh, that do include sort of use of facilities and things like that. Um, it's interesting that you measure org level um, because of course we did start off with Josh talking about the funder registry, which has 20,000 funding organizations and while that has been you know it's had as he explained had fairly low uptake because we've been um asking our um the the uh, publishers to extract that information from acknowledgements um that's a pretty onerous process um what we want to do in future is actually have a a, a global organizational identifier and uh, crossref is putting all of its um all of its um, effort into ROAR, the Research Organizations Registry, uh, which you can see at ROR.org. And probably the Crossref Funder Registry will fold into that larger organizational registry at some point. Uh, but that's a different identifier for a different topic on a different webinar, probably. <laughs> I'm just wondering, um, Ginny, if it might be worth asking um, Carly um, to comment on the choice to focus on the grant level um, because that was something mm -hmm. that was discussed across the various subgroups that she was involved in. Yeah that sounds good. Do you have a comment about that um, Carly? Sure, um, really more uh, reiterating but um, yeah there was there was a lot of discussion about kind of what could fall under um, this grant identifier. And so some of the use cases that I had mentioned were trying to get to that point. And since, um, you know, the, the funder registry already exists and, um, you know, ROAR is coming up, we had, you know, felt that it made sense to focus at that lower level. And, um, you know, assigning a DOI to either, you know, a grant or an award at that lower level makes it incredibly helpful to be able to um, track the research outputs for that specific grant or award. Um, and so that's, I think, really where the, the conversation um, circled around. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. Hope that, hope that answers it um, for you, Nate, and, and is useful for others as well. Um, another question has come in from Joao. Um, a few questions. So what's the rollout plan? So uh, the, uh, essentially the schema has gone live. Um, it's ready to be populated with grant DOIs and uh, Welcome is uh, poised to do that. There are a few test uh, records already in the system. Um, and I know that the rest of the, the advisory group also have their own sort of rollout plans. Um, but essentially the ingest of this metadata for grants is, is ready. Um, there hasn't been a huge launch because we're looking to uh, sort of, you know, grow it over time. And a, a big part of the uh, next phase will be to expose that metadata through our APIs, as I mentioned in a previous answer. Um, and that's a separate piece of work um, and then I think uh, we can show the community, okay, it's launched and it's, and it's available and you can see it. Um, uh, so yeah, it's essentially anyone, any funder can join and start registering um, grant DOIs already right now. Kirsty has just posted the schema uh, documentation in the chat window. Um, and we will, we will follow up with lots of links as well. And there's a question here also from Joao about the cost. So um, Crossref has... Um, a membership model so there's an annual membership fee which is um, much lower for funders than it is for publishers mainly um, because funders don't have that kind of um, you know administrative budget but the cost for registering each uh, grant record is higher than it is for example for journal articles so it's two dollars uh, to register 
to US dollars to register a grant DOI, whereas for a current journal article, it's one dollar. Um, so it's sort of offsetting that a little bit. Um, and it's an incentive to really to kind of grow this and uh, get funders, you know, aware of Crossref really and, and sort of start, started a bit slowly with a lowish barrier. And then another question about our other DOI registration agencies participating in the initiative. And in a sense, yes, they are, because um, the, uh, the metadata will be available to all of us. They, there's nothing to stop any other DOI agency sort of really, um, you know, copying the schema and having those grant DOIs with them, but they haven't done that. Datasite has been really involved with this and they're keen to um, share um, infrastructure with us on uh, in the back end. Um, and I think the services that will, you know, offer around this means that it's, I mean, it, right now it is totally only a cross breath led thing. Um, but we're always collaborating with the other DOI agencies for things like um, content negotiation, uh, which is a type of sort of uh, technical way to retrieve records. Um, so that's always that's always up for discussion. And I, I raised it with the DOI Foundation board last year, so they're all they're all aware. And then I see a last. Um, question from Adam Jones in the chat so everyone should be able to see that so where the grant DOI may not be easily located by us are there instructions to offer funders to pass on to the scientists to enter it manually um a better position so these uh these identifiers will be assigned by the funders so the funder will always know what the identifier is and where the record is, and they will be responsible for, for feeding that to their awardees. Um, there's a whole sort of, uh, you know, set of work that needs to be done as well around how the, the platforms and systems, so grant uh, submission systems and also manuscript submission systems and uh, data repositories, how they're going to uh, retrieve this information. But it all starts with the the funding organization who um, assigns the DOI themselves. And that's how Crossref knows about it. I don't know if others have a comment on that or if I've, if I've fully interpreted your question correctly, Adam. Um, you can jump, jump in on the chat if, if you want a, a further clarification or if, or if someone heard that differently. And I'll just jump in from Wapper's perspective there. Um, I mean, eventually we will have everything we've ever funded um, with Crossref, um, but it will be hopefully easy for, for uh, researchers to uh, determine what their um, DOI is. Um, so for example, in our internal systems, we have um, a 13 digit um, identifier, as it were, um, that says that this is the grant record in the grant system, um, but it has a six digit, which is the first six digits, um, kind of like core, uh, number which is unique to every record that's part of that family. Um, so if a funder um, wants to contact us, they'd quote that number and that number will be um, part of the DOI um, for welcome, for example. So they should be able to identify and go, right, I know my all my records um, in, with welcome are one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so they'll want to be able to go to Crossref cross sorry, and go, right, I know the um, prefix uh, for welcome funding is this. I know what my six digit core grant number is um, with welcome and then determine that, yeah that those are my grants mm -hmm. um, but yeah that's just from the welcome perspective that's great thank you Dan thanks um, and there's a final question and then I think we will close um, close the the webinar um, and it's a it's a <laughs> It's a thorny one. Are there any implications related to GDPR that have been considered as part of the implementation? So I'm not sure, at least I, I will speak for Crossref, that this came up specifically for the Grant IDs project, but certainly for Crossref as a whole, there's been a huge, uh, a huge sort of project, as I'm sure most of your organizations have been involved with the last couple of years to um, make sure that we are uh, GDPR compliant and that our metadata uh, where where it does um, you know mention people's names uh, personally identifiable information like we are we are pretty we are sort of covered by that um, and uh, probably a bit more uh, adhering to privacy than uh, of course 
people like ad, ad agencies and stuff, which is the people that GDPR was really designed to, um, to limit. Um, so I hope that answers the question, the slight dodge really. I don't think it came up for grant IDs, but if I, if I find out anything more, um, I can certainly uh, include that in the follow-up email. I can just flip through something quickly, Jenny, which is in conversations with funders where this has come up, they have been looking at the schema and the fact that many of the field personal information are optional um, means that they can gather permission and populate those fields okay. with GDPR and for some of the other information there are derogations to um, the data protection law um, to enable them to fulfill a legal function or to perform uh, their, their functions as an organization efficiently which would enable them to publish information without consent so it is complicated but on a field by field basis I think we're okay um, in terms of GDPR. Okay, that sounds good. So the members have to be compliant with GDPR, but Mothra is pretty exempt, I think, um, you know, because it's sort of an educational, uh, considered an educational, um, you know, purpose that we have. We, um, from, yeah, Welcome actually put it in our um, grant conditions uh, about how we use the data. So applying for Welcome uh, funding um, dictates what we then are able to do with the data. We publish all of our grants information anyway um, under the 360 giving format. Um, so from our perspective, there's nothing in the DOIs that isn't already available somewhere. Um, we publish it on our website, so you can go now and download the next hour spreadsheet for everything you've ever funded um, if you wanted to. Um, That's brilliant. Thank you, Dan. Okay, I will uh, leave it there and just uh, say a further thank you to our, um, our three external uh, funding uh, panelists and also to Josh for um, giving the overview and hopefully this was you know meant to be fairly introductory so we didn't get into all of the details and going through the, the schema itself and um, feel free to contact us Josh's um, email is on the screen there jbrown at crossref.org and we'll also follow up with a number of these links um, and some ideas for uh, for further interaction so um, hopefully that was useful to everybody. Um, we will share the recording as well. And um, thanks again to our colleagues in Japan for joining so late in your evening. Um, and we can release you now. So thanks everybody. Um, and hopefully be in touch soon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone.